Unit 3. Types of memory. Uh -huh. Actually, no, you, excuse me. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to the basics of what I think is one of the most fascinating topics in the field of psychology. Memory. What is memory? How does memory work? The research in this field is fascinating and dates back to the late 1800s, so it's been going on for more than a century. I'll begin today by saying a few things about three types of memory that we all have, and then we'll look at how memory is measured. All right. First of all, let's begin by looking at types of memory. One of the most common ways to classify memory is based on time, based on time and duration of use. So typically, memory is divided into three types. Sensory memory, working memory, which is also referred to as short-term memory, and long-term memory. Again, that's sensory memory, working memory, and long-term memory. Let's talk about sensory memory for a minute. Sensory memory holds information for only an instant, say less than half a second. This is just long enough to register an impression on one or more of our five senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, or taste. Let me give you an example of a phenomenon concerning visual sensory memory that I'm sure you've all experienced. Imagine that you're holding up a flashlight on a dark night. You start to move it in circles, slowly, watching it carefully the whole time. Pretty soon you aren't just seeing the flashlight, you can see a full circle of light. Of course, it's actually just one point of light being moved around, but your memory of the visual sensation of the light fills in the rest of the circle. That's one example of sensory memory. So remember, you can hold something in your sensory memory for just a fraction of a second, up to around half a second, then it fades away. Now, if you want to keep the information for longer than a second, you have to put it into your working memory. Working memory, the second type of memory, allows us to hold on to things for as long as we think about them, that is, as long as we're paying attention to them. It's something like a kind of temporary storage place. Let me give you a simple math problem. Are you ready? Here goes. 18 plus 44 plus 9 plus 19. I'll say that one more time, okay? 18 plus 44 plus 9 plus 19. All right? Do you all have the answer? Maya? Uh, I think it's 90. Yeah, 90. Let's see. 18 plus 44 is 62, plus 9 is 71, plus 19 is 90. 90 is the answer. Now, to figure out this problem, you had to use your working memory. As you did the problem, you had to continue holding the numbers in your memory until you got the final answer. If you stopped concentrating on the numbers, that is, you stopped saying them to yourself or stopped visualizing them, you would have forgotten them, and then you wouldn't have been able to solve the problem. Do you see how that works? Here's one more example of working memory involving reading. Look at the sentence, Honey is the only natural food that is made without destroying any kind of life. It's written down in your textbook. Why, you may wonder, do we need working memory to understand such a simple sentence? Well, the answer is because working memory holds the first part of the sentence. Honey is the only natural food. While our eyes move on to the last part, that is, made without destroying any kind of life, without our working memory we would forget the first part of the sentence because we got to the end. So reading even short or simple passages would be impossible without our working memory. Okay, I think you can see how important working memory is. But our working memory is very limited, and it can only hold information temporarily. It usually lasts only one and one-half to two seconds. 
and then it begins to fade. So if working memory were all we had, we would be very limited. Essentially, working memory mediates between how we experience the environment and our long-term memory. This brings us to the third type of memory that we'll talk about today, long-term memory. Now, long-term memory is involved with information that's stored for considerable lengths of time. For example, do you remember the name of your best friend when you were 10 years old? I bet you do, because this information is certainly in your long-term memory. Actually, memory that's tested after about one minute behaves in a very similar way to memory tested after a day, a week, or even years. So many scientists believe that any memories more than one minute old are part of our long-term memory. Interestingly, these memories seem to change over time in the sense that we tend to add information to them. In a sense, our memories become somewhat distorted. The reason behind these changes is that our memory is designed to keep or preserve meaning, not to keep impressions or images, but to keep meaning. For example, try to remember a conversation you had yesterday with a friend. Now, if you're like most people, you can't remember the exact words that you or your friend said, but you can remember the ideas that you discussed. Your memories of the points that were most important to you will be the clearest. So the essential feature of long-term memory is that it specializes in holding meaning. Okay, are there any questions about that? Yes. Yeah. Can you explain why we don't remember all of the details of our past conversations? So the question is, why do we forget? Well, most experts believe that if we remembered all of the details of our past experiences, our memory system would be filled with a lot of trivial information, a lot of trivial and generally useless information. Secondly, it is conceivable that we would find it extremely difficult to sift through such a, a mass of detailed information and find the really important information that we need. Uh, in other words, memory searches would proceed a lot more slowly. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to ways of measuring memory. Just as we distinguished three types of memory, there are three main ways of measuring how much a person remembers. The first of these methods is called recall. You use recall many times every day. Here's what I mean. Take out a sheet of paper. Okay, now look at the word list in your text. Drum, band, studio, and so on. Read it silently to yourself. Okay? Have you looked at all of the words? Okay, you should be finished by now. Now close your book. Write down the words you saw, as many as you can, on your paper. Go ahead. Okay, that's a simple recall test. Now most of you probably remembered most of the words, but not all of them. Our memories, of course, are not perfect, and of course, forgetting is natural. The second method of measuring memory is recognition. Okay, for this you need another piece of paper, or just turn that one over. All right, number the page from one to eight. Now look at the word list again. Okay, now close your book. I'm going to say eight words. You have to write yes or no. Yes if the word I say was on the list. No if the word I say was not on the list. Ready? Here I go. One, studio. Two, guitar. Three, stage. Four, recorder. Five, wiring. Six, song. Seven, vocalist. Eight, drum. Okay, everybody finished? The answers are one, yes. 
Two, no. Three, yes. Four, no. Five, yes. Six, no. Seven, yes. And eight, yes. How did you do? Anyone get all eight correct? Good. That's what we call a recognition test. In contrast to the recall test, recognition is more receptive and doesn't require you to produce anything. For this reason, recognition is a lot easier for most of us than recall. In other words, asking yourself, have I seen this before, is easier than remembering everything you saw. Now, the third basic method used to measure memory is relearning. Let me give you an example of a relearning test. First, you try to memorize a list of words. Then you don't look at the list for a period of time, maybe a week. If you're like most people, you won't be able to remember all of the words. After a week, you then look at the list a second time and try to relearn it. As you would guess, most people relearn information somewhat faster than they learn it the first time. By measuring the time people need to relearn information, we can calculate how much information they have stored in their long-term memories the first time. So let's stop there for today. Uh, I hope that you'll put today's material in your long-term memory, or you're going to have a hard time with the test. See you next week.